Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Outlaws and Gunslingers with your host, Bang a Dang. And for this episode, we're going way, way back to 1920s and 1930s. Uh, somehow this guy slipped through the old research when we were doing Prohibition era stuff because uh, this guy's story is pretty long. He, uh, we told you we'll be uh, figuring out what we missed and going back. Going back, might as well. Um, this guy hooks up with John Dillinger for a little bit, but uh, he has right. his own little operation he does for like. 10, 11 years, but literally robbing a bank every week. Crazy. For a while. Guy's uh, Guy was a crazy guy. We're talking about Harry Pierpont, also known as Pete. Uh, he was born in Muncie, Indiana on oh. October 13th, 1902. Makes sense, those Indiana boys. Mm, and those Muncie boys. Mm -hmm. To Joseph Gilbert and Lena Pierpont. Oh, he took his mama's last name? No, her original last name is Orcutt. Oh. Uh, so Harry, who's Joseph Gilbert? I believe that's his dad's middle name. You know, they went three names by the, back then. Right. Joseph Gilbert Pierpont. Harry Pierpont was a middle child with an older sister named Fern, hey. who was born September 21st, 1900, who unfortunately died of tuberculosis when she was a teenager. And he had a younger brother named Fred, uh, who was born July 5th, 1906. So his father was from Kentucky. His mother was from Jay County, Indiana. Jeez, oh, she was of West or she was of German ancestry. It should be illegal for Kentuckians and uh, Indianaans to uh, mate. Why? Because they're both. <laughs> All right. Probably just for anybody that listens to Kentucky and Indiana. <laughs> uh, by the 1910 census, the family was residing at 1145 McLean Street in Indianapolis, where Harry Harry's father' occupation was listed as a woodworker at a carriage factory. In 1911 and 12, the directories of the city of Indianapolis, the family was living at 1234 Lee Avenue. So you guys uh, want to go look them up. In Indy? In Indianapolis. Oh, Indiana, right. Indiana, Indianapolis. Indiana, Polis. All right. Pete graduated from the eighth grade at Assumption School in Indianapolis. He had above average intelligence and did well in school as all these guys. All right. By the 1920 census, the family was residing at 2113 Moore Street in Indy. Oh, he's got all this shit, huh? <laughs> Where Harry's occupation was listed as a bench worker. He was listed as a bench worker at an automobile plant. And it wouldn't be a bench worker. Like the little stuff that needs to be done. Put stuff together on the benches or something, right? right? They can't go through the lines. Pete's troubles with the police began after an accident in the summer of 1921, in which he received a severe head injury. Yeah, there oh, it is. There it is, boys. His demeanor was changed after that accident. Mm -hmm. Pierpont claimed of eye problems, dizziness, headaches, of course. Pete displayed bouts of sleeplessness and mania for uh, firearms. <laughs> he got knocked on the head. He was like, I love guns. I love guns, <laughs> and I can't sleep. <laughs> he stood over six feet tall with light brown hair and blue eyes. Mm, big boy. The second and third toes of his feet were grown together. <laughs> oh, dude. See, I told you. Uh, yeah, something. Told you. Uh, something in Kentucky. Right. Uh, Something about Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Something about them boys. Mm. Uh, 1921 at Indianapolis, Pierpont was arrested for carrying a concealed weapon. He was held for 10 days and then dismissed. Concurrently with his first arrest, Pierpont was committed to the state hospital. In the record of inquest held on September 19, 1921, his mother states that he became sullen, suspicious, and prone to outbursts after his injury. And two days later, he was committed to the state hospital for the mentally ill. He should have. Uh, the Central Indiana Hospital. Pierpont was diagnosed with dementia praecox of the hebephrenic type. Okay. Say what? Okay. It is. Premature it's, dementia. It's disused. It's premature dementia. So it's right. Rapid oh, cognitive it, uh, it's, disintegration. It's been since replaced with schizophrenia. So right. he's, he's a schizo. No. And what is hebephrenic disorganized schizophrenia so he was yeah he's a schizo man All right well whatever happened to his brain what happened turn him crazy january 2nd 1922 pete stole an automobile in indianapolis drove to Greencastle, where he robbed the cook hardware where he robbed the cook hardware store stealing nine handguns Good for him. five days later 
Pete was arrested in Indianapolis. It's crazy. For, you could just go to a hardware store and get a gun. Right. Uh, he was arrested in Indianapolis for attempted auto theft and battery with intent to kill. Damn. The owners of the automobile, Mr. and Mrs. Devine. That sounds like a made-up name. Right. They caught him in the act. <laughs> Struggling with Mr. Devine, Pete fired a gun, slightly wounding him. Mrs. Devine was holding a roast. And they were making fun of people. <laughs> 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 and then uh found uh, uh she hit she, she hit him with that roast over the head Ooh. oh geez well, but, i mean what's that i mean if it was hot of course it's not uh, she hit him with the pan or the roast i mean or it could have been a, a roast that they were ready to cook when he's got up in the market right. while being held in jail at terry hawk pete failed in an escape attempt. Wasn't there somebody else we covered that was at Terra Hawk? Yes. Was it McVeigh or something? Uh, somewhere. Sawing through the bars of his cell. How? Where did he get a saw? Oh, it's the 30s, dude. You know what happens in the 30s. Right. Uh, on March 12, 1922, Pierpont entered the Indiana Reformatory for a two- to 14-year sentence for assault and battery with intent to moida. Oh. On November 17, 1923, he was transferred to the newly built reformatory at Pendleton, Indiana. May 1st, 1923, Indiana Governor McCray denied Pierpont's, Pierpont's request for clemency. Of course. Superintendent of the prison wrote that Harry was as wild as a March hare. Yeah, so he's he could have done two, but he's doing more than two. Uh, he was in the prison, probably getting into fights. and. Oh, yeah, this dude's nuts. <clears throat> Pete's mother, Lena, often visited the superintendent, told him. Uh, you know what she was doing with the superintendent. Right. He's like Pete's mental boy. <sighs> Pete's mother campaigned for his release, claiming that he was insane. Well, he was. It was right. Wasn't it already documented? Right. The parole board granted him parole on the sixth of March, nineteen twenty-four. Mm-hmm. After his release, Pete worked in Brazil, Clay County, Indiana. <laughs> Not that Brazil. All right. During his first stint in prison, his family had moved. His father operated a sand and gravel business for several months. He continued to associate with several known bank robbers and may have been robbed the sour, sour wine theater in Brazil, Clay County, Indiana. <laughs> Uh, by, November, by November 24, Pierpont was living in Kokomo, Indiana, staying at a boarding house run by Pearl Elliott. He continued to associate with a group of Jeffersonville ex-cons. In April of 1925, Pierpont was implicated as ringleader of a gang that struck several Indiana banks. Uh-oh. Newspaper reports indicated there were seven members of the gang and all identified Pierpont as their leader. I'm sure they did. They or did they all get caught, too? That's Pete. We, we, we run with Pete. All right, we're on Pete. You know, that boy with the messed up head. And uh, the stuck together toes. <laughs> he boy can swim. Most members of the gang. circle because it's only his one, right. his one foot. <laughs> 245 in the afternoon of November 26, 1924, seven men led by Pierpont held up the South Marion State Bank at 31st and Washington Streets in Marion, Indiana. Okay. Uh, yeah, Marion, Indiana, bank robbery, robbing the bank of approximately $4,000 in cash. No one was injured and not a shot was fired. Okay. Five men went inside, two stayed outside. The leader of the gang walked in ahead of the others and ordered, hands up, forcing the cashier and bookkeeper into the vault. According to newspaper accounts, the gang had evidently studied the situation, knew the surroundings, and carried out their job with clockwork precision and uncanny accuracy. Nice. Good for them. Did their homework, huh? Right. Didn't kill nobody? After the robbery, the men jumped to a purring Nash motor car. Sped off going oh, south. Well, it was purring. I mean, make sure I don't want that engine purring. I don't want no uh, snoring. Right. Purring. 16 towns in a 50 mile radius of Marion were notified of the robbery and be told to be on the lookout for a Nash car with yellow license plates. One report had them heading west on State Route 35. Another report had them traveling east. Jeez. <laughs> Bluffton. At high speed, nonetheless. A couple from Fairmount. Reported seeing a car matching that of the robbers at 3 o'clock, traveling west through Hackleman in the direction of Elwood, all in Indiana. Mm-hmm. So which way do you go? So you got one saying they're going east, the other saying they're going west. Well, Grant County Sheriff Burt Renbarger and his deputies stopped a Nash car matching the description at Sweet Sir, Indiana, but the occupants were found to be out-of-town businessmen. Hmm. Were they, though? Initial reports indicated that based on the description of the bandits, they were believed to be the same gang who had robbed the Farmers National Bank at Converse, Indiana, the week before. Uh-oh. Sheriff Renbarger speculated the robbers might be from South Bend, Terre Haute, Chicago, or Logansport. Hmm. Or they could be from Mississippi. They could be from anywhere. Uh, Battle Creek, Michigan. Right. You never know. Right. Just before closing time on the 16th of December, 1924, the men made an unsuccessful attempt to rob the Citizen State Bank in Noblesville. That's Indiana. 
The bandit's car drove up to the side of the bank. Six men leaped to the sidewalk and ran into the building, brandishing the revolvers. While three robbers rushed to the rear of the bank to cover officials, the other three ordered several customers and the cashier to hold up their hands. Hands up and I won't hands shoot. Up. <laughs> the leader of the bandits repeatedly cautioned his associates to listen for an alarm. With the revolver near his head, bank president Dunn touched a button on the floor which set off the burglar alarm. Oh. Bandits immediately ran out the door and sped away with nothing for their efforts. The bandits raced north in a Cadillac bearing Indiana license plate 11829. Oh. That's got to be in the record somewhere, right? Uh, I'm sure it is. 22nd December 1924. The John D. Shelby Hardware Store of Lebanon, uh, Indiana, was robbed of two rifles, two double-barreled shotguns, hammerless double-barreled shotgun, two single-shot rifles, a Marlins repeating rifle. Well, I wonder if it was a 30-30, but it was. Two Remington repeating rifles, eight pocket knives, six-inch barreled pistol, German 32 automatic revolver, about 50 boxes of ammo, four flashlights, several batteries, and other articles. Other there was that. And others. Yeah, and others. Uh, Boone County, Indiana Sheriff Joe C. Kane notified Grant County, Indiana Sheriff Renbarger of the list of items stolen from the store and stated the robbers were driving a moon sedan. Jeez, these guys are switching it up with the license plate 443554. Oh, geez. What's going on here? Which was stolen from Indianapolis the night of the oh, Lemonade robbery. Okay. The automobile belonged to George W. Killinger Jr. of 1922 North Pennsylvania Street in Indianapolis had been reported stolen on uh, December 22nd. Okay. So, Oddly, uh, specific stats and right. uh, stuff, facts going on here. Right, and that's a uh, Outlaws and Gunslinger's last name, Killinger. I know, right. <laughs> Three forty-five in the afternoon on the twenty-third of December, and he's not even a criminal. <laughs> right, six armed bandits entered the Upland State Bank in Upland, Indiana, within fifteen minutes of closing time. Robbed the bank of approximately twenty-five hundred dollars. Mm, good for them. The bandits attempt- attempted to lock the cashier and a female employee into the bank vault, finding that the safe would not work. They began scooping up all of the money in sight, as well as the money in the safe, consisting of paper and silver. One of the bandits cautioned bank officials against making false moves under pain of having the hell shot out of them. (laughs) You move, I'm going to shoot the hell out of you. you. (laughs) After getting all the money in sight, they quickly left the bank and hopped into a waiting automobile. There's only $2,500 in that bank. I guess. In which the six bandits sat and departed north out of Upland, where it was reported they turned west. Good description of the men was secured by Deputy Sheriffs John Shell and Woody Smith, who had conversed with six men at a filling station. Oh, they they talked to the sheriffs at a filling station before they robbed this place. Um, and it's uh, weird to have six guys in the same vehicle. Right. Back then. <laughs> you would oh, think. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, they talked to them at Highland Avenue and Washington Street in Marion about two thirty in the afternoon that day. Oh. The men had been asking about the road to Hartford City and that they wanted to find State Road Thirty Five. So these cops just gave them the way to get out uh, on the getaway. <laughs> Say I'm trying to get out of here pretty fast. What's the quickest way out of your town? (laughs) Oh, for sure. Well, if I was going to leave here in a hurry, (laughs) I'd be taking uh, State Highway 35. I'd be gone and no one know where to look for you. (laughs) You'd be gone before anybody realized. Right. The men were first noticed in Marion driving a moon car bearing the license plate number 443554, which was seen driving the wrong way around Public Square. Oh, jeez. The license number matched one that had been in town about a week before when it ran a stop sign at 4th and Nebraska Street. Now, these guys are dumb enough where they <laughs> are not going to follow traffic laws. Get out of here. Apparently. But they can uh, stake out a bank. <laughs> yeah. Nah. And then it failed to stop when called on by the police. The cop was just like, hey, stop. And he's like, like, no. <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay. No, copper. Reports indicated that Sheriff Randberger notified many surrounding cities and Indianapolis, as it was believed that the gang had headquarters in that city, and was the same crowd who attempted to hold up a bank at Noblesville the week before. Indeed it was. He has reason to believe. Mm, the automobile used by the bandits of the Upland State Bank and the Lebanon Hardware Store was found abandoned in the mud at Kempton, Indiana, on December 27th of 1924. To be learned, abandoned in the mud? I think it was stuck in Probably, mud. right. They're like, yeah, we got to go from here, boys. Right. Authorities learned the car had become mired in the mud at about 7.30 on the evening of the 23rd. The men walked to a local home and called a garage at Kempton. Garage workers started to take the men to Frankfurt at their request. Carrying shotguns, rifles, revolvers, and satchels, the men changed their minds and asked to be dropped off at the edge of town at Lebanon. Hmm. The, the, the uh, tow truck driver didn't notice all the guns. Right. The men told the garage mechanic they had been out hunting uh, uh, and they were from Louisville. 
and wished to get home for Christmas. Uh, no one ever came back for the car. <laughs> for Christmas. Nobody, nobody came back for the car? Nobody no, came back for the car, and not. authorities were notified. Why would anybody come back for the car? Right. I don't think that, think that was their intention all along. Right. Well, I guess they uh, had their Christmas holidays relaxing with their families, I guess. But late Saturday evening on 27th of December, James Robbins, he's 22 years old, of Lebanon, was arrested by local police after being seen flashing a large amount of cash. You get arrested for flashing a large amount of cash. I'm sure they were suspicious of people that had a bunch of cash. Robbins confessed to his involvement in the Upland State Bank robbery, the attempted robbery at Noblesville, and the robbery of the Lemon Inn Hardware Store. Robbins' confession led to the arrest on December 29th of William Behrens. Behrens? 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 William Behrens. B-E-H-R-E-N-S. Who is 20 years old of Monticello, Indiana. Barrens, when brought to the Grant County Jail, at first denied any involvement in the Upland Marion Noblesville robberies, but changed the story and admitted his involvement in the Upland robbery when identified by the cash layer and another witness. He's like, I can't hide it now. He's like, well, I was part of that one then. But you have no evidence about the other ones? Nope. Well, both these men denied any involvement in the South Marion Bank robbery. Right. Robbins confessed that on December 22nd they had robbed the Shelby Hardware Store in Lebanon, then proceeded to Upland in a moon car that had been stolen the evening before. Right. His share in the Upland robbery is between three and four hundred dollars. Huh, he said that after the Upland robbery, the gang separated. I guess back in nineteen twenty-four, three and four hundred bucks were a couple of G's. Right. <laughs> Bayrens was identified by Deputy Sheriff Shell as being one of the men in the moon car when it was stopped in Marion two hours before the Upland robbery at the gas station. Right. Why would they even stop a cop? Talk to a cop. Right. Knowing that they could identify him later. Dumb. Barron's later confession to Sheriff Brandbarger of Grant County to his involvement in Upland robbery and told that. And told where he had hidden part of the money in Monticello. He was like, why would you say that? Right. Hey, dummy. <sighs> say, I spent it. All gone. On Tuesday, December 30th, 1924, a third member of the gang, Marion Red Smith of Springfield, was arrested in Indy. Jeez. Smith had been tracked down by an operative of the Webster Detective Agency. Nice. Got some private eyes working on it. Huh? The, they couldn't even afford the Pinkertons All right. <laughs> uh, of Indianapolis and was arrested and returned in returning. After returning via train from Springfield to Indy, hmm. Smith uh, admitted to taking part in the Upland robbery, but denied being part of the South Marion or Noblesville cases. Okay. Liars. Right. He figures, hey, one robbery is not going to put me away for long, but if I say I did all of them. Right. Now I'm in big trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Information obtained from the three men indicated that the gang was planning a return attempt to rob the bank in Noblesville. He's like, we felt bad. We needed to get that one again. Right. Robin spoke freely on his involvement. Stated to the press that he became acquainted with all of the robbers while incarcerated at the Indiana State Reformatory. Robbins and Bayrands were arraigned on the 30th of December in Grant County Circuit Court after 5 o'clock. They ended it after 5 o'clock one. Where they entered guilty pleas and were sentenced to 10 to 20 years in the Indiana State Reformatory. The very same place that they met and started being criminals. Damn, they got 10 years <laughs> for, for one robbery. Well, yeah, that's what's going to happen. On Wednesday, December 31st, Miss Mary Bridgewater, 29 years old, was arrested in Indy as an accomplice in the robbery of the South Marion Bank. Dang, it sucks to get arrested on a holiday. Right. <laughs> she denied having anything to do with the robbery, claimed to not be with the gang when other robberies were committed. Happy freaking New Year. <laughs> yeah, this is my ringing in it fucking good. Huh? <laughs> Miss Bridgewater had been visiting relatives in the southern part of Indiana and was not aware of the other arrests. Miss Bridgewater did, did admit to being one of the two women in the Nash car as it stood in front of the South Marion Bank when it was held up, though. After the robbery, the group drove back to Indy. Mrs. Bridgewater claimed that she did not receive any of the money from the robbery. Who was she banging, though? All right. Marion Red Smith pleaded guilty in Grant County Circuit Court on the 31st of December, was sentenced to uh, 10 to 25 years for automobile banditry. Oh, that sucks. Smith had just been released from the state reformatory five months prior, mm. where he had been serving a term of vehicle theft. Oh, so, geez. I mean, once a criminal, always a criminal. Friday, January 2nd, 1925, Robert Morse, 25, and his wife, Emily Morse, 27. Oh, look at, look at him dating a cougar. Right. <laughs> uh, were arrested by Sheriff Burt Renbarger and operatives from the Webster Detective Agency. Morse and his wife both admitted to not, or admitted to being part of the gang of seven people, five men, two women, who took part in the South Marion robbery, but denied being a part of the gang at Upland or Noblesville. Huh. Why? That's, <sighs> so, obviously, you guys were a part of it. Everybody should have agreed to the Upland one, but now these guys are saying, no, I did the one in South Mary. Right. If you would have just agreed to the Upland one, now they got reason I to mean, believe all you guys. Right. 
Uh, Morse claimed that he only received $153 of a, instead of the 600 promise as his share of the South Marion robbery. 153 that's pretty... Uh... Yeah, I'd be pissed. He admitted the gang's original plan was to rob a bank in Hartford City, but the gang changed their mind and headed to Marion instead on November 26th. Okay. Mrs. Morse, in contrast to Mrs. Bridgewater, admitted that she knew the men intended to rob the bank. Of course she did. Of course Miss Bridgewater did as well. Right. <laughs> 4th of January, 1925, New Year, same stuff. James Robbins, <laughs> William Behrens, and Marion Red Smith were taken to the Indiana Reformatory. So, hey, guys, I know you committed all these robberies together. Why don't you go to prison together? Dude? Right, where they will begin serving all their sentences. 10th of January, George Frazier of Kokomo was turned into the Marion police by his father as being part of the bandit gang who robbed the South Marion. And you go to jail. Right. <laughs> For your own good. <laughs> Frazier stated that Mary Bridgewater and Emily Morris knew all about the robberies. Of course they did. And that Mrs. Bridgewater had scouted out the South Marion Bank by cashing a check just before the oh, robbery. Oh, typical ploy. Send the lady in there. Right. right. I'm not going to think of anything of a lady coming in there. Mm-hmm. On the morning of November 26th, four men, whom he knew from prison, picked him up in Kokomo and told him they were looking for some place to stick up. Oh. But hadn't decided on a city. Frazier was taken to the courthouse. A warrant was sworn out. He pleaded guilty to auto banditry. Was given a sentence of between 10 and 25 years. Wow. That is crazy. At the Indiana Reformatory. They didn't like uh, auto theft, did they? Apparently not. <laughs> well, theft involving, I don't know, what is what is auto banditry? Right. When you flee in an automobile, I'm assuming. You're a bandit and you stole a Using an automobile, right. Your... Shortly before 4 o'clock, 10th of March, four unmasked bandits walked into the New Harmony Bank and trust New Harmony. Shortly before the four o'clock, before the four o'clock, <laughs> before the four o'clock drinking time. <laughs> That's happy hour, right? I don't know. Four to five? Four to six or something, maybe? Happy hour is like eight hours right. off. <laughs> <Sweet> dark, <laughs> happy hour is for 24 hours. It's always happy hour. <laughs> Shortly before four o'clock on the 10th of March, 1925, four unmasked bandits walked into the New Harmony Bank and Trust in New Harmony and robbed it $10,000. Unmasked, huh? That's a lot of money. Yeah, I know, huh? The bandits locked these employees and customers into the safe and took $6,000 in cash, $4,000 in bonds. Never understood taking bonds. Right. When the bank treasurer, Frank Steelman, failed to open the safe, he was hit with the butt of a pistol and suffered a severe scalp injury. The assistant cashier, Mr. Schultz, opened the safe <laughs> and then fainted. <laughs> oh, I can see that, yeah. A scalp injury, though. Not even a skull injury. It's uh, just a scalp. scalp. Had a <laughs> dash. Yeah. The bandits escaped in a gray Hudson sedan in the direction of Evansville, being last seen near Wadesville. Farmer near Griffin, Indiana, reported that the men held him up and was commanded to tell them where they could obtain a boat to cross the Wabash River. Hmm. By March 11th, reports had the gang spotted at King, Indiana, in Gibson County. Peace officers throughout the Midwest were wired. Descriptions of the men advised to take no chances. Shoot them. Guards were placed along every road in southern Indiana with orders shoot to kill. Fort Wayne police were also investigating the gang's involvement in the robbery of an A&P store on March 21st, 1925. These guys don't don't care, man. Why do these guys rob banks in their own neck of the woods? Yeah, well. Like, go to state over or something. You're going to, I mean, come on. They got 6000 They probably end up with 20000 30000 altogether. Maybe. That's a lot of money. And then take your ass back home. Right. You're good. Well, I mean. You feel the urge to rob again? Take a road trip. Dillinger and all them robbed in different states, and they right. still got busted, too. Yeah, so because they're idiots. Well, right. 22nd of March, 1925, Earl Northern, along with Everett Bridgewater, was arrested by Kokomo, Indiana police on suspicion of possessing a stolen vehicle. Certificate of title was in the name of Lester Isaacs of Indianapolis. However, However, the possession of the Ford Roadster they were driving was found to be illegitimate. Be legitimate. Right. Found to be legitimate, and they were released. Oh. This car was later identified as one that was used in the getaway from South Kokomo <laughs> Bank robbery. It was legit, just, yeah, right. legitimately used in the robbery. Right. <laughs> Pierpont later visited local attorney C.T. Brown. That sounds like an attorney name or They're doctor. Right. right. Along with Dewey Elliott and Pearl Mullendore after midnight on March 22nd, 1925. Lawyers are just operating at midnight and shit. Right. Oh, of course. To explain are. that two of his friends had been detained at the police station and needed representation. Oh, I need your representation. Pierpont, using the alias Mason, refused to give the names of his friends who were detained but gave him a gold certificate worth a hundo. Oh. In the morning, the attorney learned that the suspects had been picked up for auto theft, but had been later been uh, later been later released. So the attorney got a hundred bucks, got a hundred bucks <laughs> for, for nothing. For saying, yeah, they're released. Yeah, they're gone. Oh, cool. <laughs> All right. Oh, geez. One thirty in the afternoon, 27th of March, five armed bandits entered the Southside Bank at Kokomo in a bold, in a bold daylight holdup. Mm. 
a bold, bold daylight holdup. The bandits made off with $4,828.40 in cash, $4,300 in Liberty Bonds, mm-hmm. escaping in a Blue Moon touring car. The bandits are witnessed by local resident J.E. Fernung switching their car for two Ford cars, which then headed south. Initial reports stated that an additional $2,000 in non-negotiable securities had been stolen as well. Why do they take this stuff? I don't, I don't understand, understand it. it. It's going to take a while to even sell the bonds to anybody. Mm-hmm. Three local young men who witnessed the robbery reported that they did not raise the alarm because an apparent lookout eyed them closely while they were at the store across from the bank. Oh. The lookout quickly disappeared in the crowd after the robbery. The robbery took 15 minutes, and after cleaning out the bank of valuables, the bandits calmly walked to their car. The bank cashier, A.E. Gorton, reported that three bandits entered the bank, forced employees to a back room, and while one bandit guarded them, the other two gathered all the money in sight. Okay. All the money in sight. I mean, they're gathering up everybody, so they got no time to hit no buttons or anything. So. Besides the one guy. All right. A gun was put to Gorton's head. He was forced to open the vault. Gorton, who had, who had difficulty with the safe's combination, angered the bandit who threatened to blow his freaking brains out. Mm-hmm. While the bandits were working, a local resident, Vernon Shaw, entered the bank and was quickly relieved <laughs> of the $18 he was carrying. <laughs> hey, you need to deposit that? We got you. <laughs> oh, thank right. you, sir. Oh, so nice, young man. Get out of here. <laughs> Speedy, a small terrier, boldly attacked a burglar's ankle. <laughs> oh, jeez. But was kicked into the basement. <laughs> 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 the bandits tore the telephone from the wall, broke a shotgun, and took away the extra cartridges. Uh, broke it, huh? They right. could have just taken it with them. Right. The Blue Moon car used in the robbery was reported stolen the night before from Fort Wayne, yet uh. bore the license plate of a Chrysler Fation. Fation? Fation, is that right? Uh, reported stolen in Indianapolis on March 11th. Okay. The vehicle was loaded, located six miles east of the town with rear riddled with the rear riddled with bullets. Oh, they've already did um, drunk and Shooting a gun. This automobile was owned by Barrett M. Woodsmall of Indianapolis. Was owned. <laughs> Early on the morning. Might have got it back. Yeah. Bolt holes and all. Right. Early on the morning of March 31st, 1925, the Laketon State Bank in Laketon, Indiana, was robbed by two unmasked burglars. Taking between $1,000 and $1,800 in cash, the bandits overlooked several thousand dollars in bonds. Maybe yeah, they they're getting like, smart. I they're just like, want cash, grab man. those bonds. We can't even get rid of those ones right. we got. All right, let's go. Reports of the bandits tracked them fleeing in two autos to Warsaw, but failed to generate new leads. They jumped in two different vehicles and busted on out. Uh, due to the similarity of the robberies and its location, Pete and his gang were suspected. <laughs> Dirty Pete and the boys. Like, I tell you what, there's only, there's only a couple boys I know who did this. <laughs> that's, that's Pete his gang. Wabash County Sheriff <laughs> Summerlin went to Marion in response to a call from the Grant County Sheriff. Other clues had the bandit stopping in LaGrange County, where there were reports of three men in a Willie's night car. They get the most obscure makes of right. cars, dude. Oh, nice. They all look the same as any other I car. Know. I don't understand. Oh, geez. Just say a vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> hey, a car. Car. Um, at 9 o'clock in the morning, two youthful robbers, armed with revolvers, walked into the bank and looted the cash drawers while holding the cashier and assistant cashier at bay. In LaGrange County, apparently. After leaving the bank, they sped away in a Ford touring car and headed north before any alarm could be given. Where are they getting all these cars? I don't know, man. They're just <laughs> going on the street and jacking them. The Leighton Bank cashier gave a description of the robbers and stated they were driving a Willie's night car. It was a certain that the license plate on the Willie's night car. Right. That the, uh, the license plate on the Willie's night car had been stolen from a bank, <laughs> a Buick car from the previous week in Fort Wayne. Jeez. The plates belonged to a salesman from LaGrange who worked out of Fort Wayne and were reported stolen the week before. Mm. License plate numbers used by the bandits were discovered by a farmer who <laughs> lived near where the bandits had left the Willie's night and were where they returned in their Ford coupe at the, after they had stolen the money. Okay. The Ford touring car was stolen in Milford, Indiana. However, the cashier of the bank, E.L. Bright, and the assistant cashier, Ms. Violet Ogden, later failed to identify Pierpont after his arrest in Detroit. Oh. Failed. I, failed. I, 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 I don't know if it was I, him. I don't think it was Maybe him. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe he sent two of the other guys. Right. Pete, along with uh, Thaddeus Ted Skier, Skier's girlfriend, uh, Lois Brunner. Louise. Right. Were arrested by the Detroit <laughs> police at their apartment on the 2nd of uh, April in 1825. Pete was alleged to be the leader in the robbing of South Marion, Upland, and South Kokomo Banks. That's, they're still trying to get him just for those three banks, right. too. And he's robbed like seven more after right. that. At his arrest. Pete gave his name as Frank Mason, but later in the day admitted his identity. 
Revolvers and guns were found under the pillows, in the closets, and drawers of the bureaus. Harry was found to have eight hundred fifty dollars in new one hundred dollar bills Ooh. and new hundred and hundred and fifty dollar bills. I wish they had hundred dollar bills. <laughs> Crisp, right? Crisp hundred and fifties on his person. Brunner had a number of diamond rings and other jewelry. Mm. Mm. While well, one report indicated this amount was found on Skier. Either or, somebody had a bunch of fucking rings. Right, somebody had rings. Them. Other reports indicated that four thousand in cash was found on Pierpont with securities stolen and fifty four hundred recovered in the apartment. Reports indicated that Pierpont, alias Mason, was wanted in Marion for the robbery of the Upland State. Yeah, 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 we know. Police were tipped off to Skier's involvement when it was learned that the auto used in the Kokomo robbery had been stolen from Fort Wayne a few days before. Skier had been suspected in the automobile theft, and when the robbery was reported, police began working on the theory that Skier was involved. Of course. Why would you not? <laughs> right. The three prisoners waived extradition and warrants for... Pet- Petty larceny and bank robbery <laughs> were charged to Pete and Skier. Oh, there you go, bud. Jeez, by the Kokomo City Judge Joseph Cripe. Reports indicated Howard County Prosecutor Howard Miller, oh, look at that, <laughs> would pursue habitual criminal charges against both men. Yeah, I'd say they're habitual. Right, which would carry life sentences. Oh, These boys are going away for life. We'll go for life. Life. Skier had been sentenced from Allen County in 1917 to State Penal Farm on a charge of larceny. Thanks. So back in 1917, right. Harry got charged for larceny. The Indiana Bankers Association had been looking for Pierpont since the robbery of the Grant County Banks and had been on a trail for some time. Captain William Pepper of the Fort Wayne Police Department had reported that Skier had been seen at the Brunner woman's home with a large sum of money. When it was learned that Brunner intended to travel to Detroit to meet Skier, detectives followed her to the apartment shared by Skier and Pierpont where the arrest occurred. Oh, so the woman led him there as usual. Mm. Skier and Brunner were arrested and they, when they met in the city and Pierpont's arrest occur, occurred, occurred, <laughs> occurred a short time later. Jeez, dude. So right. You gotta be careful, man, when you're a freaking criminal. I understand why uh, they're so legit the first couple, you know, and they're casing this banks out and Shit like that. And they get too comfortable. Yeah, and it gets dumb. And then they get stupid. Like this here. And then they couldn't even pick people that are good enough to, when they get busted, they just don't blab their freaking mouths like they all did. <laughs> Jeez, oh, Pete. Initial reports in Marion newspaper could not verify that suspect Everett Bridgewater had also been arrested. Bridgewater's wife, Mary, had been previously arrested in connection with the gang's activities and was serving a term at the Indianapolis Women's Prison. April 3rd, 1925. James Roscoe, Whitey Hayes, a third suspect, was also arrested by the Detroit police, but later released. Conflicting reports indicated that Hayes was wanted in Detroit as a material witness in a murder case. Mm. I think they're going to... Seems like he told on something and they let right. it go is what happened there. Yeah. In Detroit, Pierpont, Skier, and Hayes were all positively identified by A.E. Gorton, who was cashier of the South Kokomo Bank, Chick Nelson, Golf professional at the country club. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm Chick Nelson, club pro. <laughs> club pro. Those are the boys. Uh, and Vernon Shaw. It was Nelson who identified Hayes, a locally known singer. Oh, jeez. And they're getting locally known people to do this stuff with them? Holy shit. Which allowed detectives to put the pieces together and track in the members of the gang. Hayes had been identified by Cashier Gorton as the bandit who stood in the doorway of the South Kokomo Bank as it was being robbed. Okay. It was determined by the Kokomo police that members of the gang had been in the city for several weeks prior to the robbery. So, okay. Case in that being. Right. Isn't that the one they said it was like expertly cased? I think it was the Kokomo or one. It was one of the three. Pierpont, Skier, and Hayes were known to have rooms with Mrs. Pearl Molendor at 718 North Main Street. Down on Main Street. <laughs> Molendor, <laughs> Molendor was more frequently known as Pearl Elliott, a notorious Kokomo madam, uh. who would figure prominently in Harry's later career with Dillinger. Uh-huh. Members of the game reportedly threw wild parties in Kokomo and Anderson, Indiana where they displayed large sums of money to their women and spent like drunken sailors. And they talked like them, too. Right. Pierpont and Skier were extradited to Kokomo for trial, and it was held in the Howard County Jail. They were brought to Kokomo under heavy guard, coming from Detroit to Peru by train, and then on to Kokomo by automobile. Coco- and we'll Coco- go to Kokomo by Coco- automobile. Kokomo must not have had a train station. I don't think so. Police denied reports that Skier confessed to the Kokomo holdup in order to spare his sweetheart, Louise Brenner. 
In his confession, it was alleged that he implicated Pierpont in the Kokomo, Noblesville, Upland, and Marion bank robberies. Okay. While being held in the Howard County Jail in Kokomo, an escape attempt by Harry and Skier was thwarted with the discovery of 10 saw blades in the cells. Holy jeez. Pierpont had reportedly boasted when captured in Detroit that he would never be held for trial. Oh, no. I'll never be held for trial. I'll never be. Pinkerton operative. Oh, there ah, we go. There Got we the big go. boys on the case. F.C. Huntington. That sounds like a Pinkerton mm-hmm. guy. Found the saws when the prisoners were being examined in city court. One bar and skier cell had been severed. Four saw blades had been used, and a bar in Pierpont cell was found partially severed. Harry's brother, Fred, was arrested on charges of aiding his brother's escape attempt, but was later acquitted of the charges. Mm, how they get him in there. Right. Pierpont's parents came to Kokomo from their home in Brazil, Indiana, on Saturday, April 4th, 1925, and arranged with the firm of Overman and Healy. With the firm? That sounds like a law firm. A firm of Overman and Healy and Carl Bree to look over the interests of Harry when arraigned and defend him in his upcoming trial. Just Harry? Was that the commercial? Come to Overman and Healy and Carl Bree. <laughs> <laughs> and Carl Bree. Pierpont's attorneys did not yet admit that his name was anything other than Frank Mason, the alias that he gave in Detroit. Okay. 5th April, 1925. Pierpont and Skier were taken into city court in Kokomo, where Howard City Prosecutor Homer Miller announced to City Judge Joe Kripe that by agreement between him and the attorneys for the prisoners, the preliminary hearing might be set for Thursday, <laughs> the 9th of April. And the judge agreed. All right. April sounds good. So, I mean, April Thursday sounds good for sounds me. Sounds good to me. Prosecutor Miller expected the prisoners to be bound over to the Howard Circuit Court, bonds to be fixed, and a hearing held before Judge John Marshall. Okay. Well, they're going to get bonded. Yeah, why not? Yeah, right. Howard County Sheriff Joseph Lindley adamantly denied reports nah. that Pierpont and Skier would be spirited away to another jail for safekeeping. Oh. Presumably at the Pendleton Reformatory. Local reports indicated the citizens were concerned the ancient jail would be inadequate to hold experienced criminals. Right. Sheriff Lindley kept Pierpont and Skier under heavy guard and denied visitors to the cell house for fa- fear of a jail delivery. Well, there you go, bud. Finally, right. some smartness. Was- Fort Wayne police reported that there were strong evidence that the trio of Pierpont, Skier, and Hayes were involved in a holdup of the A&P store uh, on March 21st there. April 6, 1925. Louise Brunner of Fort Wayne, held as a material witness and girlfriend of Skier, was released under bond and allowed to return to her mother. Hmm. You can go back to your mother. Bond of the bank bandits was set of a sum of ten grand each. And attorney C. T. Brown was engaged to defend Skier. Ten grand is a lot of money. Yeah. Um, May 6, sixth, nineteen twenty five, Pierpont took the stand and in a surprise defense move. Practically admitted to all the evidence contained in Skier's confession. What? Pierpont told of entering and holding up the bank and then fleeing to Fort Wayne, where the loot was divided between him and three others. However, However. <laughs> Pierpont stated that Skier was the planner of the robbery. Uh-huh. So this dude planned it all. all right. Pierpont was convicted and sentenced to serve a sentence of 10 to 20 and fined $1,000. That's it. Found guilty. He was sent back to Pendleton. And entered the Indiana Reformatory for it's the like, second time. It's like criminal school. Right. On May 6, 1925. He defied authorities by giving the wrong name, refusing <laughs> to recognize the warden, declining to say, you better recognize me. <laughs> recognize and it's like what? Roman Reigns out there. Acknowledge, Acknowledge me. Acknowledge me. <laughs> you get so mad when you don't. <laughs> Jeez. Declining to make a statement or having his picture taken and spitting on a guard. Mm-mm-mm. This guy was just like, piss off. Mm-hmm. It was here that he first met John Dillinger mm-hmm. and Homer Van Meter. Okay. And the rest is his story. His story, yeah. And Pendleton, Pierpont was a convict Dillinger looked up to the most. Mm-hmm. Pierpont caused the Pendleton warden AF Miles so much trouble that he was transferred to the Indiana State <laughs> Prison at Michigan City <laughs> within two months uh, after he attempted to drill through the bars of a cell in an escape time. A drill with what? What was he going to drill through? <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. Dillinger. He's up with some crazy <laughs> stuff in prison. Dillinger and Van Meter were later transferred within the next few years to Michigan City. That's because these guys were allowed to, like, do whatever uh, they wanted. Dude. Wood shop and uh, welding and all that kind of stuff. Idiots, dude. dude. Dummies. Entering Michigan City on July 3rd, 1925. 30th. Yep, July 30th. He became one of the most respected convicts by other convicts, obviously, obviously in the prison. He soon became the leader of an elite group of former bank robbers. <laughs> <laughs> Forever trying to escape. Pierpont constantly fought with the guards and was frequently confined to solitary confinement. Mm. He was known for his ability to withstand hunger and beatings. Old Pete headed a prison clique that included Russell Clark, Charles Mackley, John Red Hamilton, and John Dillinger. After his July 1929 transfer, 
Harry's ability to endure hunger and beatings won him the respect of all the prisoners. Mm -hmm. It was from these men that Dillinger learned the crime of bank robbery. By 1933, with a parole for Dillinger, an escape plan was concocted. With Dillinger on the outside, he would rob several banks on a list composed by Pierpont and Mackley, and with that money, helped finance the escape. Okay. Did we? I don't think they even mentioned Pierpont in, I don't um, remember that. in Dillin, Dillinger's I don't remember story. I can't remember. I don't remember. 29th of December, 1930. Pierpont. I'm sure they did, though. Among a group of 12 men led by Joseph Burns, were overpowered, who overpowered guard Guy Burklow and barricaded the doors of their cell block to prevent guards from entering. Pierpont let himself out of his cell with a homemade key. <laughs> Dang, this motherfucker had a prison-made key. He didn't have a homemade key. He had a prison-made key. <laughs> well, it's his home. <laughs> right. Burke was able to sound the alarm. <laughs> oh, what's the alarm? And a combined group of city police, firemen, and guards Jeez. were able to force inmates to surrender. Burns had fashioned a key from a spoon, Jeez. allowing the inmates to escape their cells. It's crafty little sons of bitches. Right. Oh, All the men God. were in cell house D. Oh. And the break occurred at a time when the guard force was limited. Others involved in the scheme besides Burns and Pierpont were Albert Roseberg, James Jenkins, Dick Day, Howard Ware, Maurice DeLatcher, Delu- De Frank Badgley, Louis West, Wayne Williams, Willard Tex, Russell Clark, all of whom were long or serving long sentences for Moida, oh. bank robbery, and other habitual offenses. Oh, geez. That's some criminals there. Yeah. My goodness, that could have been some dangerous stuff there. Cell block D, I'm assuming, is where they keep the uh, <laughs> right. the offenders. <sighs> Summer of 1932, Pierpont began to make plans for the greatest prison break in Indiana history. Mm. Pete's fellow conspirators were Charles Mackley, John Brad Hamilton, Russell Clark. This operation would depend on accomplices on the outside who had money for guns, bribes, and a hideout. It would also need someone on the inside who was dependable and who was uh who was about to be released. Dang, so I gotta find somebody who's dependable and about to be released. released. Pierpont approached Don G- Dillinger. Here Don, we go. Don Dillinger. Don Dillinger. It's, it's John, Pete. Okay, Don. <laughs> all, right, all right, Donnie. Now listen here, Donnie. <laughs> listen here, Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so he talked to John Dillinger about helping them escape. In return, he would be offered the opportunity to join their bank robbing team. The group reportedly gave him, okay. (laughs) All right, Donnie, so here's what's going to happen. Boy, I've never been part of a team before. (laughs) Don't worry, Donnie, you're in good hands. (laughs) In return, he would be offered the opportunity to join their bank robbing team. The group reportedly gave Dillinger the list of the best banks and stores to rob, as well as the names of reliable accomplices. Okay. He would know uh, almost as much as they did about bank robbery. Nice. Dillinger agreed, but insisted that James Jenkins would be in- should be included in the break. What did Dillinger go to prison for? In late 32, Walter Dietrich joined Pierpont's group. Um, I can't remember. Was it like theft or something? Wasn't it running of alcohol? Uh, oh, yeah. Convicted of assault and battery with intent to rob, conspiracy, uh, and to a uh, conspiracy to commit a felony. Okay. Oh, he expected a lenient probation sentence, but, he but instead it said sentence of 10 to 20. Oh, jeez. Talking about what we made an example of. Oh, yeah. He was robbing. He's robbing stuff? He's robbing a uh, grocery store. Uh, struck a victim on the head with a machine bolt wrapped in a cloth. Jeez. Also carried a gun, which although discharge hit no one. Yeah. What did he say? He came in. I came to Indiana Reformatory with a bachelor's in grocery store <laughs> grocery robbing. Grocery store robbing. Came and out with a master's in bank robbing. Bank robbing. <laughs> 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 Harry's like George, my friend. Harry's like Don, my friend. <laughs> Don, my friend. What do you know about banks? What? <laughs> <laughs> what, do, what do you know about banks? <laughs> That's fucking hilarious, dude. <laughs> <laughs> He began to reveal detailed techniques of the remarkable bank robber, Herman Lamb. By the spring of 1933, the plan was set. Pierpont was aided on the outside by his girlfriend, Mary Kander, who agreed to help with the breakout if her brother, Earl Northern, was added to the list of escapees. <laughs> now they're just letting everybody want somebody else to broke out. <laughs> I'll get you out, honey, but you got to get my brother, Earl. Not Earl. Fuck Earl. <laughs> <laughs> Mary's brother, Earl, was uh, Pierpont's old partner. Oh, okay. Pearl Elliott, the Kokomo madam, who had been involved in Pierpont's Kokomo robbery, was to get money 
to those who would bribe prison Ooh, guards. Good for, good for her, right? The Indiana State Clemency Commission heard Pierpont's appeal to be released from the state prison under the contention that he was a man of strong character and a leader and not a follower. Oh, yeah. okay. On August 24th of 1933, briefs filed highlighted the fact that when Pierpont was sentenced to the state prison in May of 1925, he told authorities that he would try to escape and it was their duty to prevent it. Oh. Subsequently, he made three escape attempts. In 1931, Pierpont announced that he would be a model prisoner, and it was contended he had been such since that time. Okay. Because he knew they were about to get right. broken out and shit. Right. right. The commission was informed that Pete's record included two previous convictions. In his time in prison, he had received 10 punishments, two reprimands, and one merit braid. Whatever a merit braid is. The commission denied Pete's request for clemency. Mm. September 13, 1933. Three loaded revolvers wrapped in Chicago newspapers were found near the west wall of the prison by two prisoners. Chief snitches. Prisoners Danny McGeogan, 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 yeah. Prisoners Danny McGeogan, Jack Gray, and Eddie Murphy. Oh, no. <laughs> hey, they, hey, it was around this time that they made, they were in that movie Life. Right. Where's, uh, Where's Martin? Martin. Uh, and Eddie Murphy were believed to be connected and ordered into solitary confinement. Dillinger had tossed these pistols over the wall and were intended for Pierpont and his conspirators. Obviously. Obviously, those idiot prisoners should have right. said nothing. Ooh, they got killed. Probably. September 25th, 1933, Pierpont, Russell Clark, Mackley, and Hamilton conferred during the exercise period and decided to crash out on the next day. Okay. Each man swore an oath not to be recaptured without a fight. Oh. The next morning, Pierpont, Mackley, Hamilton, Russell Clark, Walter Dietrich, James Oklahoma Jack Clark, Edward Schoes, Joseph Fox, Joe Burns, and Jim Jenkins escaped from Michigan City Ooh. using three four to five caliber pistols Dillinger had smuggled into the jail. Again, they're like, Donnie boy, we need oh, you. We need, to, Donnie, we, need, Donnie, we need more pistols. We need some more pistols. <laughs> My name's John. John. Damn it. I'm oh, sorry, Don. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Dan. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> This <laughs> All right, George. <laughs> the escape had been carefully planned before Dillinger's parole by Pierpont, Hamilton, and Dillinger. Obviously. Dillinger had spent the summer of 1933 robbing banks throughout Indiana, Ohio, uh, to raise enough money to smuggle the guns into the prison. It's a hell of a summer. All right. How he smuggled the guns in it is unknown. Some accounts say that Dillinger tossed weapons over the wall like he did on his previous attempt. Makes sense. The most widely believed theory is that Dillinger hit the guns in boxes of thread sent to the prison shirt factory. Well, these guys are idiots if they didn't check the thread, right. but, um, you know, whatever, probably didn't. At 2 o'clock that afternoon, Pierpont, Russ Clark, told shirt factory superintendent George H. Stevens that one of the officials needed to see him in the basement. Oh. Yeah, they just believed him. <laughs> In the basement, but. No problem, convict. In the basement. <laughs> right. Stevens was soon overpowered by the rest of the gang in the basement. Right. Walter Dietrich sought out Deputy Superintendent Albert E. Evans, telling him that a fight was in progress, uh -oh. leading him to leading him into the trap as well. Oh, jeez. Evans was greeted by seven men with pistols and uh -oh. three with clubs. Dang. Jeez, dude. What a bunch of idiots. Right. Dude. All the Come Dudley. On. What do they call the the, the um. Dudley uh, do or Dudley, whatever. Yeah, Dudley do right. Foreman Dudley Triplett <laughs> came to the basement for supplies, and he was captured. Oh, jeez. He didn't even know. All right. Pierpont, all right. Pierpont had received severe punishment at the hands of Deputy Evans while in prison. Oh, he beat And now him. was prepared to exact revenge. He beat him. He wanted revenge on this guy. He sure goes, did. where's Deputy Evans? Deputy Evans, where is he at? Dietrich stopped him from killing him and letting the whole prison know what was uh, happening. You don't want to alert everybody. Right. The convicts took their hostages and began to walk carefully to freedom. Mm. Stevens led the way with Dietrich on his left side and Hamilton on his right. Their guns concealed beneath the stacks of shirts they were carrying. The other men picked up a steel shaft and followed. Though they walked almost the entire length of the prison, the guards and other prisoners paid no attention to what was happening. Oh. Jeez, what is this place? Uh, this is ridiculous. Michigan City? Right. St Man. When they arrived at the first steel gate, Stevens told guard Frank Swanson to open the gate because the prisoners were armed and would kill if he didn't. Mm -hmm. Open that gate. Why? Because we're armed. So I, you, we'll kill if you don't. All right. <laughs> Swanson was forced to join the procession. <laughs> He's like, damn. <laughs> After proceeding through his second gate, they came to the third gate where they used the steel shaft as a battering ram. Why couldn't they just get the guards to open it? <laughs> guard Fred Wellnitz was beaten. Guard Guy Burklaw was forced to open the outer gate. Jeez. Now... The prisoners were in the lobby of the administration building, where they herded eight civilian clerks into the... Jeez, <laughs> these dudes them. are, like, just taking over the damn prison. 
72-year-old Finley Carson was shot in the leg and oh. shoulder by Burns for not moving fast enough. He's oh. 72. Right, jeez. Warden Louis E. Kunkel happened oh. upon the group, and he was quickly made a prisoner as well. <laughs> Damn right he was. It's the warden. Outside the gate, it was every man for himself. It was raining hard. Oh, no. The escape prisoners ended up splitting into two groups. The first group included Dietrich, Clark, Fox, and Burns. Okay. The second group that. included Harry, Hamilton, Russell Clark, Mackley, yeah. Shouse, and Jenkins. These were the important guys. The other guys were right, like, we're coming. No, you guys go that way. You guys go that way. They're the deterrence, pretty much. Right. With the alarm sounding, the Dietrich group encountered Sheriff Charles Neal, who had just dropped off some prisoners. Oh, jeez. <laughs> well, overpowering him, they took his weapons, forced him to take three of them into his automobile. Why even take him? Right. At a gas station outside the prison, attendant Joe Pauliski was struck over the head by the Pierpont group. It's just a random gas station right by right. the prison. The group commandeered another vehicle, releasing two women, but forcing the driver to continue. Mm. They headed west for a few miles, hiding in a farmhouse around 2.30 p.m. The convicts and Sheriff Neal's car purchased gas at Burdick, Indiana. Why isn't the sheriff's car full of gas? <laughs> about 20 miles west of Michigan City. Well, I guess 20 miles still. The group abandoned the sheriff's car near Wheeler, Indiana, after carjacking another motorist. The group roared off with the sheriff still their Jeez. prisoner. It had almost midnight. Mary Kinder answered a knock at her door in Indianapolis and found Pierpont standing there. She immediately asked about her brother, Earl. <laughs> oh, damn. Earl didn't make it. <laughs> uh, Northern Earl was originally part of the escape plan, but was ill in the infirmary at the time of the break. Right. Oh, Mary's pissed. Mary had arranged a place for the escapees to stay at the home of Ralph Saffel, her reluctant boyfriend. A reluctant boyfriend? Right. I thought uh, Pierpont was banging her. Right. The convicts sent Saffle and Mary downtown to buy civilian clothes. <laughs> Go buy some clothes. Don't buy any type of clothes. I want civilian clothes. I want civilian clothes. I think it. that's all they sell. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> Jeez. Pearl Elliott soon. Okay, her reluctant boyfriend. So what did uh, Pierpont make her have a boyfriend? Like you go find yourself, you so go they find can't. Yourself a man. So, so you can't be. I'm gonna be in here for a while. Well, not even that. I need you to be. I can't have you thinking. You know, does she go visit him in jail or anything? I, no, I, I think, think she so. visited him once to to, to uh, talk about the plan. She had to have. Hmm. A reluctant boyfriend. Pearl Elliott soon arrived at the Sappho home and brought money. The convicts were ready to begin taking banks on their own, only to discover that Dillinger had been arrested in Dayton, Ohio, four days before the oh, escape. Oh, no. So now they got to attempt their own right. uh, um, breakout. <laughs> and he was being detained in Allen County Jail in Lima. The gang soon hatched a plan to free Dillinger. We got to go get Donnie Boy. Mm, just, we just can't leave Donnie Boy there. Donnie in a damn prison. <laughs> He's the one that got us out. The next evening, the gang was joined by Michigan City parolee Harry Copeland, Dillinger's partner before the arrest. Okay. Oh, Harry Copeland. Yes. Who told the gang he had arranged for a house at 1054 South 2nd Street in Hampton, Ohio. However, However. the hideout would not be ready for a few more days. <laughs> we had found them temporary refuge. He's already, they're already at temporary right. refuge. But when the hideout in Hamilton was ready, the group abandoned their car in Indianapolis and stole another to hide their tracks. Okay. It's not really hiding your tracks if you're stealing things. Right. Indiana State Police Captain Matt Leach became aware of the theft, see, and threw up a blockade that almost resulted in the gang's capture. Oh, you idiots. During an attempt to get away from the police, the door of their auto opened and James Jenkins fell out. Oh, no. The gang, oh, they pushed him out. <laughs> they probably uh. did. Like, here, take him. <laughs> here, here, take him. Leave us alone. <laughs> this will slow him down a little bit, right? <laughs> the gang had to speed on, unable to wait on Jenkins, eventually stealing another vehicle before reaching their Ohio hideout. Okay. Jenkins was later killed that evening by a local posse near Bean Blossom, what? Indiana. He got killed by a posse? Yeah. Dang. The gang hit out at the farm of Pierpont's parents. Well, you shouldn't go back to your mom's. All right. At Leipzig, Ohio, as well as their hideout in Hamilton. These guys are really, uh... Goodness, <sighs> they're, now they're dumb. Now they're just... Well, they're on a run. I was going to say, I guess when you're already escaped right. from prison, so... Now it's just anything goes, baby. While in Hamilton, Pierpont realized that the group needed more money to help bust Dillinger out. McAlee suggested they rob the First National Bank in his hometown of St. Mary's, Ohio. <laughs> yeah, my mom's the teller there. <laughs> <laughs> it's only a few miles away from Lima, too. Mary Kinder rejoined the gang and agreed to travel permanently with Pierpont. Oh, left her little reluctant boyfriend, right. didn't she? On the morning of October 3rd, exactly one week after their escape, while the gang began loading into cars for the robbery, Harry Copeland claimed he was too sick to drive. Uh-oh. Oh, what did Harry Copeland do? And Mary Kinder was asked if she would drive the second car for an equal share. She's like, hell yeah. For an equal share? 2.40 p.m. Mackley entered the bank with Pierpont and Clark while Hamilton and Shouse waited nearby. The robbery netted almost eleven grand. Nice. 
The bank had been closed by the Treasury Department, but had cash on hand to facilitate its reopening. Oh. The gang had to walk. Oh, yeah, so they caught it at a good time, dude. The gang had to wash and dry the money a number of times to eliminate the new feel of the bills in order to pass them. Uh, right, because those were like right. crisp, crisp, crispy new. On October 5th, Ralph Saffel revealed the details of the gang's state at his Indianapolis cottage to Matt Leach. Oh, Saffel, the boyfriend, you knew it, you knew it was going to happen. He's reluctant. <laughs> you never trust a reluctant guy. No. <laughs> what the hell? Jeez. Well, Leach raided Mary Kinder's apartment, but was infuriated by the nonsensical answers given by her younger sister, Margaret. Mar- it's always a Margaret. Right. October 10th, Pierpont brought Dillinger's girlfriend, Billy Frechette, to Ohio. He found an apartment in Cincinnati for her and Mary. The next day, the men left for Lima. Hmm. The gang arrived in Lima on Columbus Day. Pete and Clark approached a local attorney about getting Dillinger's sister into the jail for a visit. When the attorney told them he would talk to the sheriff the next day, the gang knew they had to act fast. Pierpont, Mackley, and Clark entered the jail around 6.25 p.m. that very night, while Shouse, Hamilton, and Dillinger's first partner, Harry Copeland, remained outside as a lookout. The gang members confronted Sheriff Jess Sarber, claiming to be Indiana State prison officials and were there to return Dillinger to Indiana. When Sarber requested their credentials, Pierpont fired two shots, hitting Sarber once in the abdomen. abdomen. Mackley and Pierpont then beat Sarber, demanding the keys to Dillinger's cell. While Sarber refused, his wife dug the keys out from the drawer in order to stop the beating. The gang then freed Dillinger, locked up Sarber's wife and Deputy Wilbur Sharp, and the group escaped. Sarber died about 90 minutes later. Oh, yeah, I geez. remember this story. Poor guy, yeah. Matt Leach suspected that Dillinger's rescue was related to the Michigan City jailbreak. What do you think? <laughs> he also suspected Pierpont was the brains behind the operations. What do you think? Leach attempted to inspire friction in the ranks of the gang. During news interviews, he made a point of calling them the Dillinger Gang instead of the Pierpont Gang. That's true. It's Did always the, been uh, called the Dillinger Gang. Right. The ruse backfired, as Pierpont couldn't have cared less. Exactly. He couldn't have cared less. I hate that. People say, I could care less. I, no, that means you could. Couldn't have cared less right. what people called the gang. Call what you want. I don't give a shit. I'm getting the money. <laughs> right. Search for the gang on how to become so intense that two days after freeing Dillinger, they decided to split into two groups and then go meet in Chicago. Oh, Chicago. It's the worst place to go. Right. October 14th, 1933, Dillinger, Pierpont, Walter, Dietrich raided the Auburn, Indiana, raided the Auburn, Indiana police station for guns and bulletproof vests. Oh. Dillinger and Van Meter. They raided a police station? Yeah. <laughs> Must have been a small Auburn. I mean. A small town. If, Two deputies or something. If uh, protesters can burn police stations down today, I'm sure they could do it back then. Right, right. Dillinger and Van Meter had posed as tourists at the Peru, Indiana police station prior to Dillinger's arrest to scout out their arsenal. Okay. About 10 p.m., October 20th, 1933, Dillinger, Pierpont, and Dietrich raided the Peru, Indiana police station for more guns and bullet Jesus Pete. You're getting ready for a battle. You ain't kidding. And officials now believe that the gang had declared war on the law, with some predicting the gang would break into the reformatory to enlist an army. The Indiana National Guard was put at the disposal of the state police, and the volunteer uh, posses were formed throughout the state. So now you got little posses running around. Jeez. Meanwhile, the gang was quietly staying in expensive apartments in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Pla- expensive ones. Expensive, too. Mm. Plans for the gang's first major robbery of the Central National Bank, Central National Bank, and Greencastle, and escape routes had been sketched out by Pierpont. Okay. Mackley scouted the area and learned it was homecoming weekend for DePaul University. Oh, it's even better. And the robbery was planned for Monday, October 23rd. Okay. 2.45 p.m., a large Studebaker parked on a hill next to the bank, and four men walked into the bank. Dillinger, Pierpont, Mackley, and Copeland or Clark, hmm. Pierpont headed for one of the cages to change a $20 bill. Okay. The chain. Oh, okay. Like, can, you, can you get me tw- uh, 21s, please? <laughs> I need all the quarters, all the pennies you got for $20. Sir, that's a lot of pennies. When the teller told him to go to another window, Pierpont pulled his Tommy gun. Uh, he's like, hey, have you ever met Tommy? Check this gun out. The other gang members pulled out their guns and began cleaning money from the vaults. Witnesses clearly identified Pierpont as the leader of the robbers. Five minutes later, robbery was over. The gang walked out with $74,000 in cash and bonds without firing a single shot. They were so quiet that no one at the police station across the street <laughs> knew what was happening. Oh, With the Indiana State Police off after them, 
The gang hit out in Chicago with Dillinger, Pierpont, Mary Kinder, and Billy Freshetti. I mean, that's seventy-four thousand dollars right there. You're right done. there, done. You're done. Well, it could be. Should be. Go to Canada or Mexico. Mexico. They should live for life. Live, well, seventy-four grand in Mexico. That's <laughs> like a million dollars back then. I know. A million pesos. When I worked at Taco Bell in the early two thousands. A uh, million. They were giving a million pesos away, and it was ninety three thousand right. dollars. So, right, it would have been a million back then for sure. At least pesos, million five, some probably two million or something. You'd live for life, right? With the Indiana State Police after them, the gang hit out in Chicago. Stupid, sharing a flat at forty three ten Clarendon Avenue. The gang moved freely about Chicago on November sixteenth, one day after Dillinger and Frechetti had escaped an attempted police ambush, which we uh, right. Covered in the Dillinger thing. I believe he shot at a couple of them in the hallway. Right, right. Uh, the gang made final details for the robbery of a bank in Racine, Wisconsin. Mm. While they were watching... Um, oh, no. It was before... Um, we are members of the All-American team. We come from cities near and far. We got Canadian. Woo! <laughs> Irish number two. No, for one, one for all. We're All-American. All Each girl's... <laughs> uh... uh that would have been in the uh, 40s, right? Mm-hmm. 41. During the war, yeah. Yes. Racine, the Racine Peaches. Or no Bells, I think. Racine Racine Bells, Bells. Yeah. I don't know. That whole movie is basically all Midwest shit right there. Yeah, that's all it was. The Racine and then uh, who was the one that... They had the, like the Peaches or something. Daddy was, yeah, the Peaches. Something Peaches. The Rockefeller. Rockefeller Peaches or something like that. Rockford. Rockford Peaches. Rockford, Illinois, I believe yeah. it is. Mm-hmm. Or Chicago, or Indiana, or Wisconsin. <laughs> Either way, yeah. Anywho, at the same time, Copeland's drinking and Shouse's womanizing were causing friction within the gang. Yeah. We're like, Copeland, you're freaking drunk, and Shouse, you're, you're a freaking perv. pervert. <laughs> what the hell? That afternoon, Pierpont, Mackley, and Mary Kinder drove to the American Bank and Trust Company in Racine. Mary changed the bill while she, she cased the bank. The gang then drove around exploring the best getaway routes. Well, that's smart there. Returning to Chicago, why would you go back? Pierpont suggested to the gang that Copeland be dropped as the driver and shout. Yeah, you want a place. drunk guy right. driving you around, dude. <laughs> <laughs> There's some bitch. Constantly has that flask in his hand. <laughs> <a> flask. <laughs> well, unfortunately for them, Shouse had other plans to rob a bank on his own. Mary Kinder overheard him trying to convince Hamilton to join with him. Really? That evening, the gang decided to get rid of Shaus, and the next morning, they threw money at him and threw him out. Threw money at him. Get the hell out of here. On his way out, Shaus stole Clark's car and headed to California. The morning of the robbery, the gang read in the paper about Copeland's arrest the evening before. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. The other girls, the two guys, gone now. Dang. 2.30 p.m., 20th of November. Pierpont walked into the bank carrying a Red Cross poster. He pasted it over the front window to block the view of the teller cages from the street. Mackley, Dillinger, and Hamilton then entered the bank. Mackley yelled, Stick him up! Stick him up! Uh, at one teller who was on the phone. She's like, She's not now, I'm on the phone. <laughs> when the teller, Harold Graham, failed to comply, Mackley shot him in the elbow. Oh. As Graham fell bleeding, he set off the alarm. Idiot. Yeah, I don't know why you had to shoot him. Dumb. Pierpont ordered everyone in the lobby to lie on the ground while Dillinger marched marched the bank president, the cashier, and his assistant into the main vault at gunpoint. While the cashier struggled with opening the vault, of course they did. Two police officers responded to the alarm. Pierpont got the jump on one and Mackley shot the other, wounding him. With the vault cleaned out, Dillinger and Pierpont rounded up the cops, three female hostages, and a bank president as hostages. Okay. Using the hostages as shields, the gang marched out to their car, taking a woman, the bank's president, and an officer with them. Mackley also shot two detectives who had been responding to this incident. A few blocks later, when the car ran into traffic, the officer tossed off the running. B- <laughs> the officer was tossed off the running board. After safely leaving town with their hostages, the gang took the bank president and the female hostage to the woods, where they were bound them loosely together. Yeah, I remember this. I'll let you guys out. Story, yep. The gang asked them to stay there for twenty minutes. Mm-hmm. Can you please not get out for right. at least twenty minutes? Well, no, they told him to stay. Right. In the woods for 20 minutes. Right. Because I knew that they bound them loosely, but they're like, hey, can you please not get out of this? Right. Just stay there for 20 minutes or else. Let us get going. Tell them we're headed north. Due to the unwelcome (laughs) attention generated by their crimes and an incident where Hamilton killed a CPD detective, the gang and their their women took a long vacation at a beach house in Daytona, Florida. 
How do they know this? Uh, highlighted by a New Year's Eve barbecue, which was climaxed by Dillinger emptying his Thompson submachine gun at the moon at the stroke of midnight. Nice. A hell of a party there, yeah. huh? He's like, take this moon. <laughs> My name is John. <laughs> <laughs> Donnie, calm down. <laughs> Don, you're making too much noise. <laughs> Jeez. January 15th, 1934. <laughs> Who's this John guy? <laughs> <laughs> Dillinger and Hampton robbed in First National Bank in East Chicago, Indiana. So they go back to Indiana. Yeah, of course, why wouldn't they? Pierpont waited in the car while the other two emerged with the money and hostages. And ho- they like to have taken hostages, right? Didn't they? Now they do, right? They faced several cops who had taken up positions outside. One officer, William O'Malley, fired at Dillinger but failed to injure him as Dillinger was wearing a bulletproof vest. Mm. Oh, so he hit him, though. Dillinger returned fire, killing O'Malley. Oh, there's the first. That's really the first murder. The off, the other officers opened fire as Dillinger and Hamilton ran for the car and Hamilton was wounded. Mm-hmm. Heading out west to Lilo, Pierpont, Dillinger, Mackley, and Clark ended up in Tucson, Arizona. Flush with cash and careless, the gang made several minor mistakes, which led to their being recognized and captured Idiot. one by one on January 25th, 1934. All four men and their girlfriends were extradited back to the Midwest, Dillinger to Indiana for O'Malley's murder, the other three to Ohio for Sheriff Sarber's murder. Oh, testimony from Shouse. Yeah, they ain't going for bank robbery no more. All right, testimony from Shouse, one of the first members of Dillinger gang. Help convict oh, the others. Shouts, you idiot. Well, they did kick him out. Right. In early March 1934, Pierpont, Mackley, and Clark were convicted of the murder. While Clark got a life sentence, Pierpont and Mackley were sentenced to die in electric chair. Die. After Dillinger stunned the country by breaking out of the jail at Crown Point, Indiana, with a wooden gun yep. on the 3rd of March 1934, it was suspected that he would try to break his pals out of Death House in Columbus, Ohio. Elaborate precautions elaborate precautions were taken to keep Pierpont and Mackley locked up on the assumption that Dillinger would show. But he didn't. As he had Yeah. Right. Him and Babyface went on a little tear for a minute. He was like, Screw yeah. Pierpont. Dude. He was like, No he kept calling me Don. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna be he's gonna die. Right, I'm gonna go with you, Babyface Nelson. I'm gonna he's, gonna, he's like <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go with you, uh <laughs> Baby face Nilsson. <laughs> Nilsson. <laughs> <laughs> With Dillinger's death at the hands of the FBI on uh, July 22, 1934, and time running out for them, Mackley and Pierpont resorted to other means to get off death row. Hmm. They would try to duplicate their own friend's feet. On September 22, 1934, exactly two months after Dillinger's death, right. Pierpont and Mackley carved phony pistols out of soap cakes oh, and painted them black with shoe polish. How do you it'd be hard to paint soap? <sighs> Yeah, and made their move. Brandishing the toys, they managed to get out of their cells into the main door of the death house before rifle wielding guards opened fire. Oh, no. Mackley was mortally wounded, and Pierpont, Pierpont was riddled with bullets. Although he survived, he was seriously injured. Dang, these guys were idiots. Mm. Well, old Pete was executed at the Ohio Penitentiary on October 17, 1934. Still suffering from injuries occurred during his attempted uh, escape. He had to be carried to an electric chair. We were successfully put to death. Pronounced dead, 12.14 a.m. Jeez. His death certificate lists age, 32 years and four days. With the, we just had a birthday. Dang. With the date of birth of October 13th, 1902, Muncie, Indiana. His occupation was listed as former engineer. <laughs> his marital status was given as married. Bank robber. His mother, Lena Pierpont of RR2, Lakeville, Indiana, was the informant. He is buried in the Holy Cross in St. Joseph Cemetery in Indianapolis, Indiana. Hmm. Other media, 1973, <laughs> film Dillinger featuring Warren Oates. Pierpont is played by Jeffrey Lewis. 1991, tweet, tweet, 1991 TV movie, just called Dillinger. He's portrayed by Bruce Abbott. 2009 Michael Mann film, Public Enemies, played by David Wenman. Wenham. Public Enemies was decent. All right. Handsome Harry, or The Gangster's True Confessions, New York, HarperCollins, Publishers, 2004, a novel by James Carlos Blake. Yeah, so he didn't really get too much portrayed much in movies, huh? No, it was Dillinger. Well, he I mean he ran with Dillinger. It was an important part of Dillinger's shit, right? So, well, it was Dillinger. That obviously, they got the fame. Well, obviously, Dillinger's the man mm-hmm. <laughs> in this story. Right. Um, yeah, a lot of that stuff with Dillinger. Obviously, you guys heard if you've heard the John Dillinger episode, but had to include it obviously in Pierpont's episode. He had a, a nice, interesting little run there for a little while of course they all get sloppy and they all do stupid shit in they the end so sloppy all they were they actually do. getting away with it and 
Just think if they would have got the seventy-four thousand dollar one the first time, they probably would have been all right. You never stop. All right, idiots. They never stop. Never stop. That's the problem with these guys. It's never satisfying for them. All right. But never done. Yeah. Idiots. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? <laughs> That's gonna do it for Harry. Harry Pierpont. Styles. <laughs> Harry Pierpont. Harry Pete. Who, uh, who was, if you want to get technical, responsible for Dillinger becoming what he became. This was, if you guys forgot what his name was, they were like, who's Pete? Right. Who's Harry? Harry Pierpont. Pete. Pete. That's his story. <laughs> That's his story. <laughs> That's his story. <laughs> That's going to do it for us as well, as we're uh, a little over an hour here. Long one, uh, Good one for, for us guys. here. But uh, yeah, if you guys are interested in other history, particularly, obviously, American history, we do another show called Battles of the American Civil War, where, as the name suggests, we look at all the battles of the American Civil War from the first one all the way up to the last. We are officially... Six battles away from ending 1861 and heading into arguably the most bloodiest year of the yes. war. Uh, 1862 the, is going to be a banger. The preseason of the Civil War is just about over. Right. The last game is going to be played on December 28th right. or something like that. It's pretty much an ex- ex- exhibition year. Right, exhibition year. And now we're coming in full-blooded. Uh, here we go. Mm-hmm. We made our cuts. You know, Both teams made their cuts. They're going to keep their starters now. The rest of the guys, they put out the pasture. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Um, right. Yeah. Battles of the American Civil War all over there, wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, I'm thinking we're going to be back next week for maybe another two-parter. Of what? Either. Uh, I don't think we need to do a two-parter. Either Ruby Ridge or Waco or something big. Right. Got to be a big one coming up next, but um, it's going to be something. Uh, something with that being said, yeah, go check out Battles of the American Civil War, and we'll be back next week for Outlaws and Gunslingers. We are the Mouth of Michiganders with Bang Dang.